Overall, it was just a pleasure to further develop my animation skills and develop a new one, which was coding. It just, it just kept me uh, connected, you know? Plus, the community is full of amazing people and really, ta really talented creators. A chance for community, an escape from hard times, an opportunity to improve on a skill set. For one reason or another, hundreds of people found themselves looking for something to fill a void. And all of those people eventually found themselves in the same place. A gaming community that transcended the realms of what many thought to be possible, and created something continuously great in the face of adversity. I found myself following this community at one point when I was young, and rejoined this community years later after going through a hard time. Now I find myself more intertwined than I ever expected. It was almost as if it all led to this very moment. But before I go any further, we need to rewind. Very far back. Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there's something different about the Sonic fanbase. It's not like other video game communities, and I couldn't tell you why. There's just something about this spiky looking blue guy that invites wild amounts of creativity. Maybe it's the fact that the Sonic brand has been so many places and done so many things. He's been in cartoony forests, realistic cities, cyberspace, and psychedelic voids. Or maybe it's because the games have waned so much in quality that it's encouraged fans to think how they do things themselves. Regardless, the creativity of the fan community is immense, and nowhere is that more visible than the fan games. Our story today is that of one Sonic fan game that stands above the rest in its resilience and quality gameplay, Blitz Sonic, and its eventual evolution into Sonic World DX. In the year 2001, publisher Edigicon would release Blitz Basic 3D, or Blitz 3D for short. Blitz 3D was a programming language powered by the DirectX 7 3D engine, and was designed for the sole purpose of coding games. Although even at the time there were a ton of languages like it, what made Blitz 3D stand out was its open source nature, ease of use, and relatively cheap price point. Many years later in 2008, Blitz would go on to be the foundation of a new Sonic fan game framework. Although attempts at 3D Sonic fan games existed at this point, like the famous Sonic Robo Blast 2 and 2006's unfinished Sonic GL, this attempt would seek to marry the worlds of 3D Sonic and Blitz 3D. The Blitz Sonic project was created by the man under the online name El Giante de Yasso as a quote unquote attempt to recreate the old-school Sonic feeling and gameplay in a completely 3D environment, trying to return to the roots of what made Sonic one of the most important franchises in gaming. With Blitz Sonic, Diyasso and his team aimed to produce a Sonic the Hedgehog fan game of the utmost quality. Key members of this team included Hector Domizian Cabrera, Mark Corre the Echidna, Streak Thunderstorm, Mr. E.D. and Sephirot D.B. To coincide with the engine's release, the team members would put out this now legendary showcase video of classic Sonic in the first Blitz Sonic stage, a sandbox recreation of Green Hill Zone. The Blitz Sonic engine would go on to become very successful, with many updates in the coming years and a decent following of players and modders alike. Some of the most notable and memorable modders included users Bagjack, Lightning994, Sonic Fan NR1, Chai Shadow, and Alowix12. There are so many quality mods from around this time that could be mentioned here, but to keep it as brief as possible, some of my favorites were Burning Sands, Alux 12's Skyfleet 01, and Gravity Mine. 
While some of my favorite character mods were Ponytail Knuckles, this absolute nightmarish rendition of the Tails doll, and this big guy that I've dubbed Swole the Cat. Now while the original Blitz Sonic is still playable today, I personally would not recommend it, as most of the fun of the game came from the mods, the modding community, the stages, the characters, and a good chunk of them uh, are no longer available. It's just a thing that happens with time. However, a lot of the content can be found online. It's a good source for anyone curious to see what the game may have played like at its peak. Although the engine was certainly doing well on its own right at the time, it wasn't until 2010 that things really started to blow up, and Blitz Sonic would become much more popular than the original team could have ever anticipated. The big game changer that arrived in 2010 was the announcement by the Blitz Sonic team that the game would be going on indefinite hiatus, and the engine would be going open source through a modified Z library license. This decision meant that any programmers interested in adding any kind of graphical, auditory, visual, or physics related features could do so, and release it as their own Blitzonic engines, just as long as they credited the original Blitzonic. This amongst other things would greatly expand the possibilities for stage and character modders. Now the very beginnings of this open source Blitzonic era was akin to the Wild West. Programmers would pop up with new engines every few months or so, with few notable changes from the original Blitz Sonic, besides maybe a different key character model, or an accompanying stage mod. It seemed as if pretty much every engine at the time was equally as viable for modders. Now there are far too many of these to note, but a handful of popular ones included. 11 Supersonic 11's Blitz Sonic Burst, J. Lloyd 2's Sonic Dash, Sammy Crossett's Project Infinity, Supersonic 68's Sonic the Seven Servers, and Link Sonic 5's Arrows mod and SA2 engine, which would go on to receive a gradual stream of updates, changing the name with each iteration to things such as the LS5 Trick and LS5 Checkpoint engines. When asked for comment, Link Sonic 5 said the following. I saw a showcase video for version one of uh, Blitz Sonic back in 2008 or 9. I was hooked pretty quickly. I wouldn't really call myself a programmer, but I did my best with what little knowledge I had. I had initially started creating pretty low quality custom levels using a program called Milkshape 3D. And after that, I had moved on to making modifications to character animations created by other people within the uh, Blitz Sonic community. I was 14 at the time, and this was my basically introduction to 3D animation, which I now do professionally. However, after lending the programmers some time to really get the hang of working on Blitz Sonic offshoots, the era of everyone's engines being close to equals began to dissipate, and the two main Blitz Sonic engine competitors became Link Sonic 5 and Super Sonic 68. This rivalry, however, would fail to last much longer, as each user would go on to give their next big leaps in innovating on the formula, and only one would go on to be the basis for most of what came after. Sonic Blitz 3D Unleashed was created in 2011 by Super Sonic 68 and Zelda X19. Although multiple builds of the game existed, the only version still publicly available is Update 2.1. Notable features of the engine included an exclusive UI and menu theme, a new Sonic model with new animations, and although the animations in question were rather lackluster, the game also involved a randomized time of day cycle. The inclusion of the Alox 12 stage Ocean's Bay also came standard with every download of the engine. Though personally, my favorite feature was the ability to mod out the menu theme to play various videos in the background. This feature was rather unique and not seen in too many other engines going forward, mainly due to file size concerns. Although ultimately, the engine had a lot of shortcomings as well. 
particularly in its lackluster visuals, draw distance, and the lack of a functioning goal system, one that would end the stages once they were completed. Though ultimately, SBU wasn't remembered as fondly as the next entry on the list, I think it's important to recognize it for its particularly unique qualities that made it stand out from the competition. Blitz Sonic Ultra was created in 2011 by Link Sonic 5 with the intent to expand the features in the original Blitz Sonic. Throughout its time in the spotlight, BSU had three significant updates. Updates 1 and 2 had minor changes between them and included the following. Although up until this point, the two BSU demos were pretty competent alternatives to BS Unleashed, it was at the release of Blitz Sonic Ultra Demo 3 that the engine would almost completely overtake Unleashed, and LS5 would be commonly known as THE go-to Blitz Sonic coder. BSU3's big new features included the following. The ability to drift, like in boost titles. The goal ring was finally added so stages could be completed once they reached their end, meaning you no longer had to completely reset the game to play a new stage. And the grind rail systems from the official games were implemented. These new features were seen as a massive breakthrough with Blitzonic, and led to a modding renaissance, with arguably even more iconic stages than the 09 era. Some of my personal favorites include Chai Shadow's updated Seaside Palace, Dark Supersonic 741's rendition of Sky Sanctuary, and Aloix's Skyfleet 03 remake and Green Hill Ocean. On the character side of things, although Sonic was the only playable character, there were still cool Sonic replacement models available, like Black Knight Sonic, 06 Sonic, and Dreamcast era Sonic. In the summer of the same year, another fan game based on the Blitz Sonic engine was released, named Sonic BGE Anniversary, BGE presumably standing for Blitz Game Engine. The game was notable for being co-developed by users Twilight Zoni, Notable Blitz Sonic Modder, Sonic Fan NR1, Random X Fire, and Oz Crash. The last of the bunch would become especially important as time went on. It's also notable that each of these users were close friends of LS5's, and assisted her in minor ways during the development of Blitzonic Ultra. As a result, BGE would be built on top of Ultra's framework, and have some very similar features and controls. The game came fit once again with a playable Sonic, using even more fancy and nuanced animations, and featured Tropical Resort and a test stage, first made popular from Arrow's mod. Additionally, the game contained 8 other slots for any stage mods you'd want to add. Notable stage mods created for BGE include original renditions of Green Hill, Seaside Hill, and Jungle Joyride. Notable features for the engine included the following. The game would also introduce objects that could take control of the camera for the player. This meant that stages could now have more dynamic camera angles, and even have players navigate a stage from a 2D perspective like the classic Sonic games. Unfortunately, trying to play the game now seems to immediately cause a crash, so for all we know the game can no longer be played. And although there's not a lot documenting the project's reception, it can be seen online that it was at least moderately positive. Built upon the previously mentioned Project Infinity, Blitz Sonic Advance was released in May 2012 as a new Blitz Sonic engine from Sammy Crossset. Its first demo release wasn't particularly memorable, only really notable for including a new homing attack system and the option to have Tails as a sidekick to help you get around some stages. However, its updated counterpart came with a lot of ambitious new ideas. This updated version was crudely dubbed Blitz Sonic Advanced Final, which had a series of four updates itself. Throughout these updates, there were various improvements including new shaders being added, a new boost system which allowed for speed to gradually increase, new and improved animations, and many new characters. A more in-depth look at all of these releases can be found on Sammy Crossette's channel. 
Upon starting up the latest version, 1.4, it appears that the characters available were the following. The game also allowed you to play with either Sonic's Classic or Soap Shoes, and gave the player a choice of Super Form between Super Sonic and Dark Spine Sonic. The stages included appear to be Green Valley, City Escape, a modified version of the Arrows Mod Test stage, Planet Wisp, misspelled Planet Whip, unless perhaps that's a pun on not being finished, and new renditions of Sky Sanctuary and Crisis City. In my experience, although levels are technically completable, reaching the end will just start the level over while the music is still playing, causing an awkward moment of the same music being played twice over each other and out of sync. I also really enjoyed the inclusion of the Egg Pawn as a funny joke character, and the way it's been animated to make it look as if it really has to get to the bathroom is just a nice cherry on top. Although considerably jankier than its competition, Blitz Sonic Advance would go on to influence a number of future Blitz engines, especially with the inclusion of so many characters already built into the game as playable. Built on its predecessor, Sonic BGE, Blitz Sonic Heroes was created by Ozcrash in 2012 as an attempt to replicate the gameplay and controls of 2005's Sonic Heroes. The game is notable for increasing the list of playable characters dramatically, much like the original Sonic Heroes. Although similar in vain, the unique qualities of these characters were a bit lacking, not to mention coming at the expense of some of the other previous enhancements. For starters, the fluid animation seen in BGE's result screens were removed and replaced with static poses. In general, the animations were behind the time and very lackluster. I'm also not a huge fan of the more Heroes-esque art style rather than the more modern one replicated in most previous engines. Though despite this, it should be noted that the menu and UI present here are easily the cleanest out of its competition. The list of teams included the following. Team Sonic, Team Dark, Team Rose, Team Chaotix, Team Time, and Team Robotnik. Featuring Metal Sonic, Egg Robo, and a strangely on foot Eggman wielding a very bizarre gun mechanism. The list of stages included the following Final Rush, Seaside Hill, Ocean Palace, Crisis City, and Chai Shadow's Lost World, with predictable appearances from the original Blitz Sonic Green Hill, and Tutorial, along with 23 other slots for stage mods. In terms of actual gameplay and physics, the game would make a number of very big changes, differentiating itself quite a bit from its predecessor. For one, the turning looks and feels considerably more awkward and looser than before. The game would also see the addition of a new over-the-shoulder camera style which was very third-person shooter-esque rather than the traditional behind-the-camera style present in most 3D platforms. Taking from Heroes, Blitzonic Heroes implemented character power-ups and enemy health bars, as well as team and character switching mechanics. The game also added some translator tech, allowing for forced 2D sections where the characters would be forced to only move on a 2D plane, similar to the Sonic Boost titles releasing at the time. It also streamlined the usability of locks, in terms of miscellaneous options, the game also included moddable character slots, a debug mode for modders, and the promise of an eventual online multiplayer component. The dev team included Blitz Plum, Sonic DBZ Fan 07, a pseudonym for BSA's Sammy Crossett, 3D Sonic U, Sonic Fan NR1, The Famous Clash 2, 06 Hypersonic 60, JLoy 2, 8-Bit Dragon, and Santatos, with minor help from Link Sonic 5. The first demo was released in late 2012, a second demo in March 2013, and a final third demo in June 2013. Next up, built on top of the original Blitz Sonic engine, Blitz Sonic Colors would see the introduction of programmer Darth Sonic 2 into the Blitz Sonic community sometime in 2013. 
Although not a huge game changer, Blitz Sonic Colors included a few new important features to the world of Blitz Sonic, as well as some of its own unique touches, including the following. Blitz Sonic Colors also included a more streamlined and easier to use version of translators. These were also particularly customizable, letting modders determine things like the time frame in which a translator would be active, and how quickly it would go into effect. By default, the game came with the Arrows mod test stage, as likely could have been guessed. In total, there were three released versions of this engine. However, the differences between them don't appear to be documented, and the only version still publicly available is Release 1. Another fan game based on the Blitz Sonic engine, Sonic Blast Adventure was made by user 3D Sonicu and was released back in 2013. The game went for the route of imitating the boost titles, like Sonic Unleashed and Sonic Generations, which were popular at the time. Upon booting up the game, the player is greeted to a well-made menu offering both a single-player and multiplayer experience. And while I was unable to track down anyone sorry enough to join, it has been reported to be somewhat functional and offer four-player support. The single-player mode appears to include three sub-modes. However, upon closer inspection, mission mode doesn't actually seem to change anything, and while story mode has some nifty percentage screens for Sonic, Shadow, and Silver, actually completing a stage will just cause the game to softlock. Unique to this game is six playable characters, Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, Shadow, and Silver, each with unique, albeit mostly lackluster abilities. I personally really like the modern, sleek, Unleashed style models here, and although some of the animations are quite good, some are definitely a little janky. The game appears to have 10 stage slots, although weirdly enough, in the game's files there are references to specific stages, Emerald Coast, BGE Green Hill, Metal Harbor, Speed Highway, Mystic Ruins, Sky Sanctuary, OCP, maybe Ocean Palace, and Toot, most likely Tutorial. Despite the references, these stages are nowhere to be found in the game, and trying to trigger them always leads to a crash. The stages that are accessible are predictably Blitz Green Hill and the Arrows Mod Test Stage. The Blitz Green Hill is especially notable for its uh, unusual objecting choices, let's say. For reference here, every character starts out with a short, uncontrollable run forward. Yeah, I didn't actually do anything here besides press pause. Additionally, the controls seem to strangely include some debug mode commands. You have the ability to place chili dogs, fans, and even invincibility monitors. Overall, Sonic Blast Adventure was an interesting attempt at concepts better executed in other engines to come later. In October 2013, Sammy Crossette would release the highly anticipated sequel to Blitz Sonic Advanced. Super Blitz Sonic Advanced was particularly notable for two big things. One, the game was the first Blitz Sonic engine to contain an actual hub or adventure field, like in the adventure games. Although this one appears to be a bit basic and doesn't do too much to tell the player about what stages are even available in said hub. Although multiplayer was attempted for Blitz Sonic releases in the past, such as Sonic Kid Next Gen's Genesis Redux project and the previously mentioned Sonic Blast Adventure, this appears to be one of the most popular multiplayer modes in Blitz Sonic, even if it uh, had its major inconveniences and performance instabilities. In addition to the cast of the previous game, Super Blitz Sonic Advanced adds characters Rayman from the Rayman series, Silver, Mighty, and Rouge. In regards to stages, the engine's roster is now, in order, the following. Green Valley, Emerald City Streets, Emerald City Roofs, Desertic Base, Jackpot Highway, Snowy Hill, Tropical Island, Purple Temple, and Factory Mountain. With Aqua Ruins, 
Dimension X, Mecha Hill, Ruined City, Final Rush, and the Death Egg, all in the game's files. The game also expands upon a feature in the original where you could change different camera modes, allowing for some really interesting and unique angles, as well as fixing up the restarting stage error from the original, though completing a stage will only really give you the option to return to the hub or restart, no stage select option. Glad to see something's been done with these accelerators. Overall, Super Blitz Sonic Advance was a respectable step up from its predecessor, and an exciting engine that offered a lot of unique features for its time. Another direct successor titled Ultra Blitz Sonic Advanced was planned, and in the works. However, nothing ended up coming of the project bearing such a name. A sequel spin-off engine dubbed Sonic Blue Storm suffered a similar fate, being released but dying off extremely quickly. The next engine is known by the crude namesake Link Sonic 5 Engine 2, created by... Take a guess. Development of the engine started back in 2012 and stopped in 2014. What's interesting about LS5 2 is that despite showing promise, the engine's final update was actually abandoned. By the time I was thinking about taking a hiatus from Blitz Sonic modding, mental illness was basically wreaking havoc on my mental state at the time. It was a user by the name of Anonymous who inspired me to create one last mod, a sequel to uh, LS5 Vengeance 2, titled Project Salute. At the time, what it was supposed to represent was a final salute to a game engine that had long been showing its age. I had created a character model specifically for the project, I, as I have with most of the Sonic mods I made, as well as implementing a lot of features that I found fun. Eventually though, my still undiagnosed bipolar disorder had caused me to make some impulsive and destructive decisions in my life. And to drop most of the interests I had at the time, including coding and animation, unfortunately. It actually took me a very long time to pull myself out of the place I was in mentally. Uh, maybe a decade. And it's just something I'll have to uh, live with and closely monitor. In the end though, I ended up releasing the source code uh, on a YouTube video. Despite that, this would most certainly not be the end of LS5's time in the Blitzana community, as she would later go on to become a developer and character animator for the ongoing Sonic World DX, under the new moniker Marble. In spite of the engine never making it to its planned final iteration, LS5 Engine 2 found some success and appreciation for the time. Notable features for the engine included the following. A playable Tails in addition to Sonic. Unique visual effects and aesthetics. The inclusion of stage teleporters. And streamlined ways of importing custom stages and characters. As a result of Link Sonic 5's popularity, the engine was particularly well received among the community. And to this day, there is still a lot of nostalgia for many of the engine's quirks, like the unique Sonic character model, and many of the stages that were released as mods and compatible with the engine. To illustrate just how popular Link Sonic 5 was in this community, somebody was even kind enough to make her an official theme song. Although Project Salute would not come to fruition, concept art still exists of what Sonic may have looked like in Project Salute, as well as concept art of what Sonic would eventually look like in Link Sonic 5 Engine 2. And although not technically relevant, to tie up the loose ends of LS5's story, she is currently heading up work on a new Unity engine called the Marble Fox Engine, with fellow Blitzonic alum, Alina Fox. Now, for the big moment, the one we've all been waiting for. On February 14th, 2014, came the game that would stand above the rest and change the Blitz Sonic scene permanently. The Sonic World Engine Release 1. And it, 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 it was not, it was, honestly, it was not that good. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Conceptualized as the antithesis of what Blitz Sonic could be, 
Sonic World was meant to bring in as many characters as possible and stand above the rest in terms of its presentation. The Sonic World engine was built from the Blitz Sonic Heroes pipeline. Led by Blitz Sonic veteran Ozcrash, the original Sonic World team consisted of the following. 06 Hypersonic 60, Axiom Ghost 13, and Blitz Plum for character animated, Sonic Fan NR1 for stage modeling, and 3D Sonic U, Blitz Sonic Advance Sammy Cross Set, J. Loy 2, and Cypheus for programming assistance. I was kind of sad to see it was no longer being worked on, Blitz Sonic Heroes. So I decided to email him, the original creator of Sonic World, to see if I could like work on it myself. And instead he offered to let me join the team for Sonic World. Initially I was actually brought in to help with code stuff, and I wasn't really familiar with uh, anything to do with Blitz coding at all. <laughs> but I did manage to like get my head around it pretty decently quickly. Using the same source for character models as Blitz Sonic Heroes, the team was ultimately able to fit 20 different ones into the finished product. Although as a trade-off, each character had very bare bones and lackluster animations. With the reduced amount of time it would take to implement all the characters, the characters in question were the following. Also notable is the fact that unlike Blitz Sonic Heroes, you cannot play as a team. Upon starting up the game, it is immediately noticeable that Sonic World's menu and UI are very excellent, much like Blitz Sonic Heroes. Unfortunately, the wonky turning and physics of Blitz Sonic Heroes are still present. Due to these and some missing objects, it's speculated that Sonic World may have actually been built off of an older backup of Blitz Sonic Heroes. Also just like Blitz Sonic Heroes, the Sound for Silver's psychokinesis abilities is uh, distractingly based. Upon reaching the character select screen, the game presents all the playable characters with their rolling 3D models and a view of all of their controls, as well as an info section. Much like Blitz Sonic Heroes, the game made promises of a potential multiplayer and online mode similar to what Super Blitz Sonic Advanced was doing. In terms of the game's stages, it's even more bare bones than Blitz Sonic Heroes, going from the engine's seven stages to this one's three all of which being returning levels from the predecessor. Here we have Seaside Hill, Final Rush, and the Arrows Mod Test Stage. However, despite this, each stage had four alternate missions, which swapped out the goal of getting to the goal ring to one of four alternate objectives. Time Attack, Ring Collector, and Treasure Hunter about finding three red rings, which were scattered throughout random parts of the map, and the bluntly named Killer about defeating a certain number of enemies. However, in spite of Sonic World's lackluster launch state, the engine would premiere at the annual Sonic Amateur Games Expo, or SAGE for short. For those unfamiliar, SAGE was, and still is, an event where the Sonic fan community would advertise all the fan games related to the blue blur that had been released within the year. Sonic World would headline SAGE 2014, and go on to receive a fairly mixed to positive reception from the community. And in spite of all the engine's flaws, the team was adamant about going further with the project, this time with a new goal. See, while Sage at this point was particularly known for being an annual event, this year would be a bit different. For whatever reason, there was actually set to be a second Sage event scheduled for early August. Hoping to meet this August deadline, the crew marched on in development, patching up issues, and introducing new content. Released less than a month later, Sonic World's first update, Sonic World Engine R2, would grace the public on March 3, 2014. Although the differences between R1 and 2 are minor, there are some changes of note. This time around, Big the Cat would make his return from Blitz Sonic Heroes. Following all of R1's issues, the physics were tweaked in very minor ways. However, probably the biggest change the game had to offer was the confirmation that the once promised multiplayer mode of R1 had been officially abandoned. However, in its place instead was the promise of something equally as ambitious, story mode. Unfortunately, however, the stages remained the same lackluster 3 as the ones already present in R1. Ultimately, while not providing too much more, Players still reacted positive with the promise of a full-fledged story mode, making their imaginations run wild, and eyes eager to see what would come next. 
In December 2013, right off the heels of the cancellation of Ultra Blitz Sonic Advanced, Sammy announced something even more exciting. The development of the first engine that would make its way into being a full-fledged game project. That's right, BSA would be getting the continuation, but now as Sonic Universe. With a planned story mode and its own cutscenes announced to soon be added, the first demo for Sonic Universe would release March 30th, 2014, in between Sonic World R2 and 3. Unfortunately, being that the game is only a demo, the entire thing is much lower on content than Super Blitz Sonic Advance. Although the physics and quality of the levels are definitely comparable, upon startup, the player is treated to this neat new title screen, and then immediately thrown into picking single player or multiplayer, and afterwards one of three different characters on a still bit of a crude character select screen. While not as organized as Sonic World, I think Sammy should be applauded for how much style comes across here. Stages have also been cut down this time, going from Super Blitz Sonic Advance 9 at a time, to now only 5 at a time. This time the roster would be the following. Seaside, Kingdom Valley, Rainbow Road, Planet Wisp, and Arrow Garden, none of which properly labeled. Additionally, the files would contain additional returning stages, Aqua Ruins, Emerald City Roofs, Green Valley, Rusty Temple, and Snowy Hill. Immediately upon starting it, it is noticeable that the stages are mostly meant for Sonic, with Silver and Shadow being technically playable, but realistically less viable. It's also not particularly different from Blitz Sonic Advanced, save for some different UI elements. Stages are just as broken and barren as they used to be, and the stages still only allow you to continue or replay, so there's still no option to return to the select screen. Overall, there's really not much more to say about the Sonic Universe demo. It was a pretty neat alternative to Sonic World at the time, with even less polish, but some neat ideas, and considerably better character animations. Released once again in relatively close proximity to its predecessor, the Sonic World Engine R3 dropped on May 2nd, 2014. This version would be the first to really start showing changes from the original release. R3 is particularly notable for a number of unique experiments that would hint at what would come as development continued. This time, the dev team would be joined by new member, massively heavy hitter Nibrock Rock an artist well regarded for his 3D renders of various Sonic characters. While Nibrock would help out with numerous things like stage and objects, he would mostly be responsible for providing his own fan-made 3D models for the next batch of new characters that debuted in this version, Marine the Raccoon, Tails Doll, and Metal Knuckles. Now right from the get-go, the player will immediately notice something different when starting up the game. The menu and UI is totally different. However, this is no permanent change, but instead, an introduction to the player about the release's newest big inclusion, Menu Themes. A feature which let the player change the aesthetic of the game's menu and menu music. The themes present here included sky, space, island, underwater, and city. Beyond this, the stage select menu has received a total overhaul, which now gave the player a better view of all the stage's available missions. While missions were available in the other two releases, their inclusion was extremely bare bones and easy to miss. This time, however, they're more visible and come in more variety. Gold Pursue is a new spin-off of the killer mission type, where the player had to hunt down specific enemies painted gold. Stealth was a mission where you immediately die if enemies see you. And Escape, aka Cosmic Clone where a mysterious purple phantom version of the player chases after you until you find a balloon to end the stage. There is also a hidden fourth new mission that while in the game's code never made it to the actual release, likely due to quality concerns. This mission in question was Escort, which saw the player escorting NPC Vanilla the Rabbit to the goal, with the game warning you if you trailed off too far. Unfortunately, Vanilla would also be unable to jump, making every hypothetical mission impossible. In spite of this, Vanilla would make it into the game in the info section as a non-playable character. This time around, the stage roster had finally been expanded as well. In addition to the previous stages, we received the original stages Tokyo Street 
and Love Garden. Besides this, rings and other objects were now more properly animated. Switches and teleporters were added, as well as plants and improved textures on characters. Overall, R3 was a minor step up from the previous two iterations, but it wasn't until the next entry that things really started to take off for Sonic World. Another three months after the release of R3, Sonic World would once again return to Sage, for Sage 2014 Act 2 on August 3rd. However, this version of the Sonic World engine had a distinction. While the first three releases were nothing more than a framework, R4 would be the moment Sonic World would begin to aim higher. No longer was it an engine, instead Sonic World would take the Sonic Universe route and make the jump to instead being known as a fully fledged game named just Sonic World. Going back to the main menu screen, the work in progress story mode button had been removed for the time being, instead replaced with the bios that were on the character select screen before. Though of course the real big change that blew everyone's minds was the re-implementation of the teams from Blitz Sonic Heroes. I could go on about the intricacies of the team system that are specific to R4, but a trailer released by Ozcrash at the time says it best in my opinion. This time around, the only new team members included in the credits were for voice acting the new characters, while members who left the team included Axiom Ghost 13, 06 Hypersonic 60, Jloy 2, and Blitz Plum. In regards to menu themes, R4 came with the addition of Expo, a sort of grid-based menu that reminds me a bit of a digitized arena. While on the character side of things, R4 would be the most impressive entry yet, boasting newcomers Mighty, Ray, Fang, and Bean the Dynamite. All were modeled by Nibrock, though strangely none were assigned to any teams like the others. The physics and controls were definitely overhauled a decent amount for R4. Turning and handling was still a bit janky, but some characters like Mighty, Shadow, and Metal Sonic had excellent moves for getting around said lackluster handling. All things considered, the controls were the best they've been for the project so far, and could definitely be overlooked in appreciation for the vast amount of refined, visually impressive ideas and playable characters. R4 also saw the introduction of Hero, Dark, and Cute tracks that would play different songs for certain stages depending on which character you played as. It's also notable that while the teleporters from R3 did return, they had a more sleek design in R4. In terms of missions, R4 saw the introduction of a new mission type, Confetti Parade. Said mission had the player popping a certain number of balloons present in a level until completion, while the Escape slash Cosmic Clone missions were removed. Speaking of removed content, R4 would also unfortunately see the removal of the stage Love Garden, while no new stage would take its place, knocking the stage roster down to only four options. However, Reflecting on what was brewing not too far behind the scenes, this exclusion would make a decent amount of sense. Newcomer Mighty is also notable for just how different he was in comparison to later releases. Overall, R4 would be a massive success for Sonic World, seen as a colossal step up from the last Sage release, and garnering an overwhelmingly positive reception with many well-known YouTubers, such as Kabanamani456, showing it off and recommending it to the greater community. The giant slam dunk that was R4 ended up becoming instrumental in the future of Blitz Sonic, the Sonic fan game scene as a whole, and of course, the future of what Sonic World would become. And the craziest part of all, there was still one more release of the game slated to be shown off before the end of the year. Released a predictable three months later after R4, R5 would reach the public on November 29th, 2014. Substance-wise, R5 would provide a lot of features to spice up the formula, and give players a much greater sense of progression. To do so, the big new draw of Sonic World R5 was the introduction of emblems, 
A player would be awarded emblems for beating missions and double the emblems for beating them with the highest possible rank. These emblems would then gradually be used to unlock the new characters present in the game and the additions from the last, as well as the ability to use custom teams. Although no new menu themes were present in R5, the game was also the first to implement a streamlined modding system. This new inclusion would grow the game's community tremendously and usher in a new massive wave of extra content for the game. Some notable modders at the time would include Jalex777 and Austin Reed, each with long lists of stage mods ported from the prior Blitz titles, and Blitz veteran Alawix12 with legendary stages Egg Factory and Pumpkin Castle. On this occasion, the dev team would be joined by a new member, Shahars71, brought on to help with objecting. I was really heavily into Sonic Generations modding, so I was kind of into the in that headspace at the time. So I ported a few old Blitz stages, uh, starting with Osprash's uh, Rusty Ruin. And yeah, that's pretty much how I got into Sonic World. I then officially uh, ported Wild Canyon to uh, R5. In regards to characters, however, R5 had a considerable amount of newcomers, including Chaos, Bark, Mephilus, interestingly with a bio that retcons his original origins from the games, Tiara, a character from the unreleased 90s game Sonic Extreme, and the Babylon Rogues from Sonic Riders, Jet, Wave, and Storm. Upon being unlocked, these characters would be divided into the teams Oldies, Hooligan, and Babylon, in regards to physics, believe it or not, there are even bigger tweaks here than in R4. For one, turning and handling is way, way better, and this, combined with some of the moves that made traversal really fun in R4, gave the game a chance to really shine here. This time around, there's a whole bunch of new stages to play around with. Although Love Garden still remained missing, R5 added Chocolate Pit, a port of the Sonic Adventure 2 stage, Wild Canyon, and most notable of all, the most difficult and nail-bitingly intense level of all of Sonic World, Worst Cave. A bit of interesting trivia here, the stage was originally created by Nibrock under the name Con Pieto Cave, as the level was covered in these pointy crystal objects, which to Nibrock bore a strong resemblance to the Japanese candy Con Pieto. The name Worst Cave actually came from Oz, as an inside joke since the stage was so unbelievably difficult. To fit these new stages, there were once again new additional mission objectives. Some of these included Mock Speed, where the player is forced to move forward at all times, and Perfect Run, where the player has to finish the level without dying once. The game would additionally be the first release to be Swarked. For those unaware, Swark is a software used to encode and compile files, so they aren't visible on someone's computer. This measure was taken with R5 due to the popularity of R4 and its open source nature, with other fan developers stealing animations and other assets, and using them for their own projects without any proper credits. R5's final notable addition to the game was the inclusion of Superforms. Superforms unlocked after receiving 60 emblems, which honestly doesn't do too much besides look cool, make you go faster, make you lose rings, and absolutely tank the frame rate. At the end of the day, there's really not much to say about the impact of R5. Everyone loved R4, so the game was still riding high off its coattails. What is notable, however, is that from here on out, there would no longer be Sonic World releases every three months, instead the team opting for a much more reasonable annual Sage release. The content put into those releases was very quickly put together because that first 15% is just that initial coding, those basic animations, you know, ripped from other games or taken assets and polishing stuff up slightly. But in the later releases, you know, a lot more effort was put into a lot more content and polishing things up with a lot of new animations and levels and systems. And that stuff takes way more time if you want to get it right rather than just having a very bare bones basic idea. The team felt there was enough attention on the game that they could simply focus on really setting things down and getting to work on putting together the finished product, hopefully under the name Sonic World R6. However, this isn't exactly how the plan would end up going.
Jumping ahead only a month, the first full release of Sonic Universe would take place on December 7, 2014. Although the game's story mode was scrapped, the amount of content would return to once again being comparable to Super Blitz Sonic Advance. This time on Load Up, you would once again be given the option of using a Hub World or Stage Select screen. Although similar in concept to the Super Blitz Sonic Advanced Hub, this one would be completely different in layout and introduce the player to all the new stages available much better. The Hub World would also be much more comfortable and fun, fit with NPCs, a skill shop I'm not sure how to activate, and portals where the player could enter a stage as is, or instead change their playable character. In regards to characters, the playable roster would return back to 12, with the Egg Pawn and Sonic carrying Amy hidden in the files. Although not every character would be given the same amount of attention to detail, as they're basically their Super Blitz Sonic Advance counterparts. What is notable though is the ability to change costumes depending on which character you are, with more options to come in future releases. Getting into the actual gameplay, although there aren't too many notable changes, one very apparent one is that enemy aggression has gone way up. These guys want you dead. The second you get anywhere near them, they snap to you like magnets and knock you the f*** out. Luckily, they at least have a bit of cooldown before they go for you again, mostly, but this is something you as the player are definitely going to have to quickly adjust to. Other than that, the moon jump has been removed to stop players from cheating, and that's really about it. In regards to stages, R1 had a whopping 19. The following included Green Valley, Emerald City Streets, Emerald City Roofs, Desertic Base, Jackpot Highway, Snow Ride, Snowy Hill, Tropical Island, Sky Sanctuary, this time named Purple Temple, Factory Mountain, Aqua Ruins, Dimension X, Mecha Hill, Ruined City, Final Rush, Death Egg, Windy Hill SB, and Ports of Seaside Hill, Metal Harbor, and Emerald Coast. Overall, Sonic Universe R1 was interesting, but came out a bit past its time. By this point, Sonic World already had beat it by a wide margin in terms of polish and quality. And seeing as World wasn't exactly brimming with that either, that says a lot. That being said, Sonic Universe certainly had a very cool unique flair to it, even if it was beginning to show its age as it was coming out of the gate. Now, before I get into talking about the actual Sonic World R6, I wanted to take some time to do something a little different. See, while the core elements that make up Sonic World might seem pretty obvious now, looking from the outside, in the year time span between R1 and R5, the idea of what Sonic World would be was a bit of a fluid concept. As a result, there's a giant treasure trove full of lost and unreleased content that for the most part wasn't officially abandoned until the team really had the chance to sit with the game during the R6 development cycle. Of all the cut content, the most notable thing was the story mode promised in R2. Now while these plans changed and evolved all the way through until R6, the general plan and gist remained the same. The story mode would contain a series of original levels modeled by Nibrock, and each team would go through a series of them until fighting another team and then eventually fighting a final boss. Of course, all of this is easier said than done, especially with so few team members. And while perhaps this task would have been fairly obtainable with the right amount of planning and willpower, when looking at the plan, it is immediately clear that these are not things the team possessed in this instance. I was in charge of essentially designing what was an ever-changing base concept from uh, the original creator and yeah initially it started with like five teams but then more characters were added so then it had to be six teams and i think by the end the concept was to have eight teams but some of the teams were teams of two and some of the teams were teams of three which very much messed with the flow of like the system and it was also meant to have like bosses and repeat stages and we had a design document the infamous eggman forklift uh being certified comes from that concept of uh a list of boss ideas i had one of them being eggman forklift 
which was just a random like concept of just Eggman plus some random object. Siphon and Oz went wild with ideas, until at one point there were as many as 34 new original stage ideas floating around, and even a chart that mentioned the number 36 for this game. Regardless, the number of original stages was, in my opinion, absurd, even for a couple of people to do. There were also even mentions of four unique bosses, named the Egg Kraken, Egg Mosquito, Egg Slasher, and Egg Pimp, respectively. Once push came to shove, though, only a small fraction of these realistically went anywhere. Sonic World R6 released on September 9th, 2015. Although the plan was originally to put the game out at that year's Sage, the event was actually cancelled that year due to a lack of staff availability. The new big feature promised this time around was the implementation of the previously scrapped Chow Garden. The Chow Garden, I, I think still stands as a technical marvel for Blitz Sonic. It's such an intricate system. Nibrock worked so much. It was just grueling. There's so many parts, so many moving pieces, so many stats. Unlike 2014, this time around, Oz used the large amount of time leading up to the release to increase excitement for the game. Putting out a trailer, like for R4, and getting YouTuber Retro Rampage to give his impressions on the game a month before its release. Now once again I could go into detail about all the intricacies of the Chow Garden, but I'm going to let Oz's own well-edited video on the matter do the talking. For R6, the list of characters added a number of new additions, all locked from the start, including Tikal and Heavy Slash Bomb, with the latter subsequently being dispersed into Team Oldies, while the stages added finally saw some more sizable additions, such as Middle Harbor, Nibrox Honeycomb Highway, and Crisis City and Ocean Palace finally returning from Blitzonic Heroes. Some more notable additions from R6 were completely revamped move lists for the characters, a new more streamlined debug mode, the removal of the super forms from R5. Besides this, rings were reanimated to move in a faster and in a less choppy manner, and the camera was finally recentered to the player instead of having the previous over the shoulder view like before. The missions once bluntly referred to as Killer were also renamed to Destructor here. Unfortunately, while all of these things are known, the finer details are not, as I was unable to track down a copy of this release that doesn't immediately crash on startup. So for now, we're just going to have to stick with the info that's publicly available. What is known for sure, however, is that this release would be the first to receive some criticism, despite still being seen in a positive light. Notably, players were critical of the still unimproved animations, and frustrated at all the moveset changes, and the removal of super forms. Fans would also note that the game had some of the worst performance issues that the game would ever encounter. Regardless, the new debug mode made modding even more accessible, and carried the game on to the release seen by many as the absolute peak of Sonic World and its modding scene. This time, R7 would once again be released at that year's Sage event, October 15th, 2016. Unlike the past few versions, Release 7 wouldn't see any major game-changing tweaks or inclusion, besides just adding on to what came along with R6, and addressing the issues that made it not as well received as R5 before it. In comparison to R5, new members of the dev team included Jalex777, Lady Lunanova, Dr. Flash 55, Wish Dream, Y Chef, Agent Enzo, 
and Alouix 12 for numerous new additions. While Sammy would leave, an OG team member 3D Sonicu would change his name to Wiz Genesis. In regards to menu themes, R7 would come with the whopping new additions of Winter, Heroes, Forest, Rainy, Adventure, Sunny, Volcano, Amusement, Windy, Retro, Mania, Night, Kingdom, Rush, Advance, and Dream. Visually, R7 would be the peak of the game's visuals. In regards to characters, R7 would welcome newcomers Shade the Echidna, Honey the Cat, Emerald from Sonic Battle, E102 Gamma from Sonic Adventure, and a new category of characters referred to as Ori's. See, Ori's would be a blank slate with character movesets that modders could build on top of. Of course, in spite of this, you could still play as the brightly colored skeletons before being modded. The physics have also been tweaked, although now too far in the other direction in my opinion. The controls are way stiffer than before. In regards to stages, the game had a large number of new additions, adding to the roster dramatically. This time around, new stages included a security hall port, a redone version of Sonic BGE's Green Hill, original Alowick stages Pumpkin Castle and Wave Ocean, new original versions of Casino Park, Rusty Ruin, and City Escape, the game's first ever boss stage, Mission Street, a harder boss stage, Grand Metropolis, and ports of Emerald Coast, Prison Lane, and Dawn Avenue. This time around, new mission types included Flicky, based on Sonic 3D Blast, where you defeat enemies to get the birds inside, Boss, self-explanatory, Rival, defeat another character on the roster, and Robot Carnival, a series of enemy waves that you'd need to defeat. Additionally, the Chow Garden from the previous R6 remained, and Superforms were reintroduced into the game, albeit without the broken flight mechanics and graphical issues. Said Supers also now applied to every character in the game, as opposed to before, when it only worked with a select few. R7 would also be the first game to introduce controller support, although unfortunately the controller support in question resulted in a number of invasive glitches. And last but not least, R7 would see the introduction of vehicles via the board. R7 would go on to be seen as a return to form from R6 and be hailed by a section of the fanbase as the best version of Sonic World that was made. As a result, the modding community blossomed massively at this time and became the most active it's ever been, with new stage, character, and theme mods spilling out at a rapid pace. To capitalize off of this, Developer Shahars71 would begin doing regular live streams with other community members where he would play through and showcase the mods as they released. This led to even more community engagement and fans being as enthusiastic as ever about Sonic World. The, the live streams, I, I had a lot of fun doing them and I would love to do them again if I had the time. Not too many people made stages for R6, so when R7 showed up and just a ton of stages were being made by really talented people. It, it, it was honestly just really exciting. I created this stage called Desire Drive. Close to the release of R8, what ended up happening is that the, a bunch of the community members went on stream and played Desire Drive. And it had a particular set piece. And when uh, you played through that set piece, everyone went quiet and just said, wow. And that moment stuck with me for a long time. Internally, however, things were a bit different. At this point in its development, the team was beginning to lose steam and passion for the project. Team members would cite the more prevalent criticism, and dissatisfaction with Oz Crash's leadership is key reasons. As a result of this growing sense of burnout, it was eventually decided that the game's next release, R8, would aim to be the final full version of the game and its last release. But before that would come to pass, there were a number of important events for the Sonic Blitz community that would go on to influence the future greatly. Two years following Sonic Universe R1, R2 would be unceremoniously dumped out to the Blitz Sonic community. 
Why such depressing language? Well, it was because just before crossing the finish line, the computer which housed the source code for the game took an eternal nap, meaning the game was lost. Feeling discouraged and not having the manpower that Sonic World had, Sammy would simply cancel the project and release his most updated build of the game on December 13th, 2016, as an apology, while still dubbing it Sonic Universe R2. Unfortunately, Sonic Universe R2 wouldn't really be all that exciting or different from R1. The main thing of note here is that the menu UI and HUD are finally more organized, taking heavy inspiration from Sonic World. Additionally, you can now finally exit a stage back to the menu screen, although in some cases this can be a bit glitchy. Costumes have been removed this time around, as has the shop with nothing meaningful replacing them. Additionally, no new characters or stages were added to the game, ultimately resulting in what's nothing more than an alternate version of Sonic Universe R1 with a nicer coat of paint on top. With the unfortunate death of Sonic Universe, and the end being near for Sonic World, heavy doubt was put on what the future might hold for Blitz Sonic, although it wouldn't totally be without additional experiments as we can see moving ahead slightly. Started some time during the development of R7, Sonic Earth was a new Blitz Sonic project that would share many of its developers with Sonic World. Minus some of the new, soon to be relevant faces, such as team lead the Sonic clone, website designer the D4 guy, and voice actors Landy and Sergeant Gerbil. There really isn't a ton to note about Sonic Earth besides that. Its development was short lived before falling apart without even a public release. Development was eventually restarted on the Unity-based Hedge Physics engine, but still wasn't able to get any more notable. Besides Earth, there was also two other fan games being worked on by some of the Sonic World devs in their spare time. However, the details are better saved for later, when it becomes more relevant. Sonic Earth, however, would eventually live on as an official theme mod for the later released Sonic World DX. As was tradition at this point, Sonic World R8 would release at that year's Sage event on December 18th, 2017. This time around, the aim was to make this the big one, the grand finale, the release of Sonic World encompassing everything they possibly could have thought to add. Amongst these new additions was the introduction of the new special stage system. With this in place, rather than unlocking super forms through getting emblems, the game would instead unlock special stages. Much like other Sonic games, completion of all seven would grant you super forms. R8 would also include the all new marathon mode, in which the player could play as their character of choice or a randomized one through all of the game's stages in a randomized order, kind of mimicking something you'd see in a story or arcade mode. Besides these, the game added more of everything and spiced up the enemies a considerable amount. This time on the dev team, the group would be joined by the largest batch of newcomers yet, including Sergeant Gerbil for stage making, Christabo0723 for menu art, Originality Ace and Anti Miles Prower for stage modeling, Sonic Earth devs D4 and Landy for stage banner art and voice acting respectively, CII for stage work, and Yarkaz, Fireless, and Blitz veteran Redler Red 7 for enemy animations. This time around, the only name no longer on the list was artist Agent Enzo. In regards to menu themes, R8 would see the introduction of new themes, Special, Buddy, Chow, Summer, Classic, and Sacred. New characters that came to R8 included Mech Tails and Eggman from Sonic Adventure 2, Egg Robo finally making a return from Blitz Sonic Heroes, E101 Beta, Metal Sonic 3.0, Gemeral, Milk, the Combat Mech Chow, and unbelievably, joke characters The President and The Commander from Shadow the Hedgehog. This time around, the team would once again backpedal on the character moveset control ideas and decide to re-add the extra attack buttons from R4. Once again, there was a massive number of new additional stages added to the roster. These would be Shy Shadow's Lost World, Dark Supersonic Sky Sanctuary, original renditions of Crazy Gadget, Bridge Zone, Diamond Dust, 
Hydrocity, Hidden Palace, Wacky Workbench, the frankly unfortunate rendition of Windy Valley, The Goat, Starlight, and Westopolis. Love Garden returning from R3, Misty Gorge, Boss Arena's Coral Cave, Death Egg Mark II, Night Carnival, Arc Lap, Egg Carrier, and Stardust Speedway, and ports of Radical Highway, Green Forest, Dry Lagoon, Frog Forest, Sand Ocean, Tropical Resort, Radical Train, Twinkle Park, and Kingdom Waterfalls. Although this version would see no new objectives, the bosses were expanded on in comparison to the previous version. E101 Beta Mark II from Sonic Adventure was added to the game. R8 would also see the introduction of the new chase bosses, or bosses that would be fought while running. Amongst these was the most difficult incarnation of an Eggman boss yet, and the hardest of them all, Mecha Sonic, who had some unbelievably strong attacks. This chase boss idea would also be extended to rivals. The concept of vehicles from R7 were also expanded on a bit in this new version. Twinkle Park now having a car vehicle, and Misty Gorge having a glider. However, in spite of all these new additions, R8 was seen much less favorably than its predecessor. Now while this may seem odd at first, as this version added a significant amount of content, the logic added up. Characters often had copy-based abilities. I used to, def to, def to defend the character variety in Sonic World, but now when, when I'm looking at Legacy, it's just, it's pretty obvious. A lot of characters are just slapdash from a bunch of other movesets. This on top of the revamped movesets, which saw fit to add even more once unique moves to other characters, caused many of the playable characters to lose their identity a bit. The new additions on the stage front were notably more mixed in quality this time as well, with stages like Sand Ocean, Windy Valley, Westopolis, and Kingdom Waterfall failing to live up to even the worst of R7. Of course, I personally think this is seriously underplaying the quality of Bridge Zone and Starlight but I can understand the opinions of players at the time. So while R8 wasn't quite as well received, the game was still a triumphant finish to the game's development, right? Well, not quite. See, in spite of the team's plans, Sage 2017 came and went, and Oz still felt like he had more things he wanted to add to the game. With a number of eager new developers brought on to finish R8, feeling as though they similarly had more to offer the project. So in spite of the audience hype being at an all-time low, the team pressed onward. After all, why not do a little bit more? It's not like doing more could do any real harm. Disclaimer: The following section is told purely for the purposes of documentation, and is not meant to offend or demonize anyone, but rather show how the events affected the developers and in turn, the game's development as a whole. Although the development of R9 started fairly uneventful, with the team plugging away throughout most of 2018, things would take an unexpected turn when October came around. At this time, a user whose name is better left unmentioned began work on a 3D fan game of their own. Let's uh, call them Redacted for convenience. In any case, Redacted sent the developers a fake cease and desist letter, claiming that their own fan game was in the process of being officially licensed out by Sega, a la Sonic Mania, and Sonic World was too similar, therefore needing to stop production immediately. That f***ing situation. That was god awful. This guy shows up one morning and he's impersonating some bigwig official at Sega or whatever and he's like, hey guys, you gotta get away from Oz, we're shutting this thing down, he give us this sort of NDA or some sh We told so many people, like, because it was just, it was just hearsay, uh, trust this guy. But it got to a point where, like, the people that we trusted were vouching for that guy. And so we just believed him. It turns out he's a, he's an imposter, and I purged my entire YouTube channel of anything Sonic World because I panicked. I panicked. I thought like privating or unlisting these videos maybe wasn't enough. Maybe like a uh, whole uh, that that there's a legal case over here. Maybe I don't know. I, I was afraid. I was scared. Turns out he was fooling everybody. And then later we had to be like, oh, by the way, this didn't happen. This was just we were just confused. 
Do you know how stupid that made us look? Like, as stupid as humanly possible. And I felt like an absolute dumbass because I lost this absolute treasure trove of experiences. I had a lot of fun times with my friends uh, in the live streams and all those videos and... Oh God, what a shame, you know? It really screwed me over. It just... God, it, it, screwed, it screwed it over everybody, but it, that ultimately led to the dissolution of Legacy Sonic World and basically the community breaking away from Oz. To make matters even more devastating, this not only led to the erasure of Shahar's livestreams, but numerous mods and even versions of the game. In addition, Redacted would bring to light a number of actions taken by Oz Crash, best not to recount. Overall, it was thought for the best by everyone to disband completely. Meanwhile, at the same time, fearing that the hard work that went into R9 would be lost, a rogue playtester hastily leaked an unfinished R9 out to the public. While easily the buggiest version of Sonic World to exist, this doesn't mean R9 wasn't full of its own unique and interesting features. In an effort to do damage control, a number of devs made some quick changes and released their own slightly more polished version of the game. Since this version is the most widely accessible one, and released with the intent to be called R9, it will be the one treated as such and compared to the other versions going forward. Right off the bat, the most visible change present in R9 was the level select, which was now changed to be ordered by the release date the game the level was based on was from, with the wholly original Sonic World levels being put last. I'm a tad split on this decision to be honest. See, while this was a major improvement in terms of general organization, it came with the unintended side effect of the levels having a pretty uneven difficulty curve when played in order. Although I suppose that was already kind of a thing present in previous versions. The only new character to show up in R9 was Infinite from Sonic Forces. The stage additions once again jumped up dramatically, adding a whopping 20 stages taking the total number of stages up to 75. These stages included Ports of Ice Cap, Speed Highway, Final Egg, Aquatic Mine, Meteor Herd, Seagate, The Better Off Forgotten Power Plant and Egg Fleet, Lethal Highway and Cryptic Castle, a new, much better rendition of Westopolis, original renditions of Labyrinth, Chemical Plant, Azur Lake, Surfing Waters, Ice Worst Cave, Null Space, and Starlight Carnival. In spite of this, Mavs were considerably more common, and a number of these new stages were particularly poor in quality. Beyond new content, vehicles were also expanded on even further, allowing for the player to do tricks in the air and introducing the Jet Ski, Tornado, and Motorcycle Vehicles. There was also the character movesets, which unbelievably were revamped again, adding yet another new button to everyone's move list, and giving every single character access to the brand new bounce move, which to be fair helped out a lot with the stiff controls that were present since R7. Overall, no one really knew what to make of R9. Some fans appreciated it for its increase in content while some were even more disappointed by the further degrading of character-specific movesets and oversaturation of stages varying in quality. Regardless, it's what the fans had to make do with, as at the time, it seemed almost definite that this would be the final incarnation of Sonic World. And for a long time, it was. Following the disbanding of Sonic World, the developers made the decision to put more focus on another side project that was already quietly brewing. A new separate Sonic fan game. One with a roughly similar team, but free of all the emotional baggage of Sonic World, and the issues of the now very outdated Blitz 3D engine. This side project would originally go by the name Sonic Dystopia, though quickly shifting to Sonic Omniverse so as to not cause confusion with the unrelated fan game Sonic Utopia. The game was planned as a Unity remake of World, porting the various characters, stages, and systems to that game, but to a new engine free of the common Blitz issues like the memory access violation crashes. Running off a heavily modified version of Unity's Hedge Physics engine, 
Omniverse featured a team mostly comprised of former Sonic World devs. However, it would be notable for the first appearance of the future Sonic World stage modeler, Joda. This time around, Joda would be responsible for brainstorming the game's new story mode, which would end up being one of the few things to actually be fully explored during the game's development. The plot of Sonic Omniverse would follow a new original villain named Paragon the Gerbil, who would get a hold of the Phantom Ruby from Sonic Forces. His goal would be to create a perfect universe by stealing zones and locations from Sonic's world, and putting them in their dimension, thus giving a reason for why the stage roster, similar to Worlds, would be all over the place. The project in terms of gameplay would only go about as far as a physics test level, using a number of new tech programmed in by the project's composer and programmer, Bomb. Additionally, concept art existed for one of the new levels that would have been made for the game. This level in question was named Quake Forest, and as explained by developer Shahar71 on a live stream, It was basically, as the name suggests, a forest devastated by an earthquake. We thought it was a really original setting um, that we really wanted to explore. Possible layouts were also sketched up by Red the Red 7 and Joda. Although things seemed promising initially, the project's progress quickly slowed dramatically as the team began to unfortunately become unable to consistently work on it. What would ultimately lead to the project's cancellation was the rise of another Sonic World spin-off. Sonic World DX started as the third of the Sonic World team's three side projects post R7. The game was initially conceptualized as a remastered, redesigned, and recoded version of Sonic World, meant to in particular address the poor quality character animations and lack of consistency in stage quality. While the project initially picked up a lot of steam as it never involved Oz Crash, the project would of course be put on hold once the redacted situation would occur. However, as mentioned before, in a matter of weeks, the team would learn the truth, that the situation was all a farce. And seeing as the original Sonic World was seemingly fully dead, they could go as far as they wanted with overhauling it. The team would readopt the quality over quantity mentality that initially made World appealing, and restructure it so that no one person was the creative lead, but instead the responsibility was shared through a number of developers. It may sound a little confusing at first, what with the name and all, but the best way to look at Sonic World DX is as a completely different game made from the same engine and framework as the original Sonic World releases. Although World DX would eventually go on to be very successful, it certainly took some time before it really hit its stride. The initial active dev team roster for Sonic World DX included veteran Lady Luna Nova as lead programmer, world veteran Wiz Genesis and returning after R6 Sammy Crossett as assistant programmers, Gerbil, Originality Ace, Brandon, Trinick, Chaos, Cypheus, and Jalix777 on the stage end of things, and D4, Landy, Camo, Red the Red 7, and Ultimate Darkman on the character end. Of course, some members would end up doing multiple jobs, and others would be credited for keeping their contributions in DX, but I'll keep the list at this for now for organization's sake. From the start, the list of reworks the team wanted to implement included sprucing up the animations and reworking physics, removing the team system to increase stability, overhauling the moves for all the characters to make each as unique as they possibly could be, character movesets being streamlined to be simpler and overhauled to include skills that could only be performed once a skill gauge filled up, revoicing all the characters so that they would all have an equal amount of voice lines with consistent quality, the addition of warp rings Rings that could transport the player from one mission to another. The inclusion of an expanded gallery, referred to as the Collection Room. And most notable of all of them, something that would radically shake up the core gameplay loop. See, in the original releases, missions were simply the same stage but with a different objective. However, here this was expanded so that alternate missions had their own information documents, which meant hypothetically, each mission could now have different weather, textures, filters, times of day, different music, and go as far as even being a different stage in its entirety. 
This gave stage modders an unbelievable amount of freedom to explore. And that wasn't even the best part. Another new addition to the formula was the inclusion of five red rings, hidden in the first mission of every stage. Once these red rings were collected, they unlocked a secret fifth mission of every stage, this being the Encore mission. For those unaware, the concept of Encore mode was created in Sonic Mania, where the player would go through another harder version of the previous levels, but with them now taking on a slightly different aesthetic. At the time, all these changes were looking extremely promising, and on February 14th, 2019, exactly five years after the release of Sonic World R1, players would have their first taste of the game in the form of the Sonic World DX Anniversary Demo. Ultimately, the Anniversary Demo wasn't much. It included a single stage, a new rendition of Kingdom Valley, with a single character, Sonic. The demo did, however, include a new, although ultimately unused, UI theme, some work-in-progress tweaked physics, and controls, and the aforementioned warp ring that would take the player to the next of the three Kingdom Valley missions. The demo would go on to receive mixed to positive reviews, with many players interested at what would follow. However, despite the positive public reception and a number of excellently received subsequent videos and trailers, issues would once again be brewing behind the scenes. While the team had initially agreed to a structure in which there were no project leads, and everyone was equal, two users eventually rose to the top, lead programmer Lady Lunanova and stage designer Chaos. Now there was nothing inherently wrong with this, as such a thing will always naturally happen when a group of human beings are put together. However, over time, it became clear that this structure would not work, with the lead programmer not really meshing well with the rest of the team. Ultimately, Luna and the team parted ways amicably, and her replacement would come from an unlikely source. An old name, likely long forgotten at this point. On February 19th, 2019, mere days after the demo's release, the team would see the reintroduction of Blitz Sonic Colors creator Darth Sonic 2, now going by the name Mark. Mark was initially brought on to help with stage work and objecting. However, once Luna made her departure, Mark would go back to his programming roots and be promoted as Sonic World DX's new lead programmer. Once the dust had finally settled on the previous Oz Crash and Redacted debacle, the revamped Sonic World DX dev team would begin to take the project in an exciting new direction and reorganize their hierarchy. While they still maintained a system of having more than one lead on the project, the game now had three appointed project managers, each heading up a different area of development and reporting to each other to keep the workflow moving efficiently. These three project managers would include D4 as the head of character work, Gerbil as the head of stage work, and Mark as the head of programming. This new method seemed to be a winner for the team, as the structure was put in place and held on to for an extremely long amount of time. With that set in stone, progress on the game remained smooth and the game would once again release a new demo about one year later at Sage 2020. This version would of course be dubbed the Sonic World DX 2020 demo. This time around, the dev team would see the additions of Mirror of Despair for stage work, Yellow Drill for objecting, Blue Speed Mouse, Strike, Orby, and Gygus for character work. While well, the team would lose Trinic, and as mentioned before, Camo and Luna. In regards to menu themes, the game decided to shift directions and focus on referencing other Sonic games rather than the general aesthetics like City or Sky. However, there was of course a new original theme, and one paying homage to the classic Sky theme. But beyond this, the themes were based on Sonic Adventure, Sonic Heroes, Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic 06, Sonic Forces, Sonic Lost World, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Colors, and Sonic Runners. In terms of characters, the demo scaled way back and for the sake of not giving too much away, only gave the player the options of Sonic, Tails, and strangely enough, Shadow, who in this game unfortunately mostly played like a worse version of Sonic. Character movesets were also significantly revamped. Sonic only regained the spin and boom kick abilities, with bounce activating automatically on stomp, and unlocking a light speed attack with a full meter. 
Tails retained the tail swipe while receiving a new cannon shot ranged attack. And Shadow, while not being able to do the light speed dash through rings like Sonic, could punch on the ground, throw a Chaos Spear in the air, and have the choice of two meter attacks. A Chaos Boost which would give Shadow increased damage, and Chaos Control which would freeze time. In regards to gameplay, the physics would see a massive improvement from R9, although becoming a bit slower and a lot floatier in the process. Additionally, the idea of Encore missions were greatly expanded on, and pushed to their absolute extremes. Emerald Coast became flooded with rising water. Green Hill became its desert variant from forces. And once modders got their hands on them, Green Hill would become Red Mountain, Sky Sanctuary, Night Palace. The possibilities and changes in level design were put to its absolute furthest. My goal as stage designer was, was a lot of things. Originally, uh, what Encore Mode was supposed to be was just a palette swap, and then some different objects here and there. It wasn't supposed to be like these brand new experiences. So when Seaside Hill came around, I was like, oh yeah, I want to do Resort Island because it sort of looks like Resort Island. And then I had the idea, I was like, this, um, like I feel like I'm just going through the same stage with a new coat of paint. And I can't do anything to change that really. But what I did do is I was like, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to redo all the objects. And it's like, because of that, that's sort of the standard that we've built for Encores nowadays. You know, just more being more open to these crazy ideas for Encores, you know? Like, just go wild. Like, make it a new experience. Some levels were also given massive overhauls, with baked lighting, new objects, and even enemies themed around specific areas. DX2020 would launch with eight playable stages to try. Green Hill from Sonic BGE, Love Garden, Green Forest, Emerald Coast, Hang Castle, the Anniversary Demo's Kingdom Valley, and a new original rendition of the Sonic 3D Blast stage, Volcano Valley, along with the new test stage. One particular inclusion I thought was neat was for missions 3 and 4 of Green Hill. The map for the original Green Hill, as in the Blitz Sonic test version, was used. This was a particular one that hadn't been seen in quite some time. The debug mode was also overhauled for modders, leading to a much smoother modding experience. This time, modders were given the ability to reload a stage to see changes made to their object. There was also an option to reload the stage from your current position, and the player could maneuver the playable character in a variety of different ways. As someone who used this system a lot, I can confirm it was probably the most convenient version of debug mode we've gotten so far. Ultimately, the demo did well, although received some negative attention purely for being associated with Sonic World after the whole Redacted and Oz crash debacle, as well as being on the now very outdated Blitz hardware. Shadow was also criticized for being pretty underwhelming when compared to Sonic and Tails, and many players weren't even aware of the Encore mechanic. In spite of this, the demo quickly garnered a dedicated fanbase of modders, and if nothing else, would radically increase the excitement for the impending release of the full game. This modding scene would end up being the largest it was in a number of years, and see the introduction of a few new important faces, including former Sonic Omniverse dev turned stage modder Joda, popular character modder Dilovsky the Fox, and stage modder Drox342. Notably absent from the DX team was founding legacy member Ozcrash. Due to his previously mentioned actions brought to light, Ozcrash did not return. However, unhappy with the state of R9's forced release, and dissatisfied with the creative direction DX was taking, Ozcrash released a new version of Sonic World on his own, on August 2nd of 2020, meant to be the true, definitive version of the game from one of its original creators. While it's tempting to say this is the definitive edition of Legacy Sonic World, there are a number of features both good and bad that make the answer unclear. Now while R10 had mainly just small fixes from R9, additions would include another two new stages, his recreation of Jungle Joyride from Sonic BGE, and a new level taking place entirely in the Tornado Vehicle, which was originally planned for R9. A fix for controller support which again was a massive improvement. The introduction of an option at the end of levels to take the player to the Chow Garden. A number of frog presets, an idea already implemented a bit more in depth in DX. Fixes for many of R9's stability issues. 
Character abilities were added with the intent to make many characters better and more in line with each other skill-wise. In spite of this, the well-regarded Westopolis port from R9 was removed, and the stage select screen was no longer listed in chronological order, instead being ordered randomly. Ultimately, Sonic World R10 wasn't much more than Oz Crash's way of giving a final goodbye. Going out on his own terms, and helping to disassociate Sonic World Legacy from Sonic World DX. Now while technically speaking, 2021 would be the first year since its conception that Sonic World wouldn't see an official release. There was an attempt to hold over fans with the release of a small previously scrapped side project from co-creator of World, Wiz Genesis. This project would be Blitz Sonic Online, a project which finally delivered on the old R1's promise of a multiplayer mode. The game would function through the use of a service called Logme in Hamachi, a VPN service which allowed users to create their own private servers they could add their friends to. The game featured 10 possible stages and a very expansive skin system, which would hypothetically let you change your character. In spite of this, the animations, physics, and graphics were very lackluster, and the game didn't really have much to offer outside of a few laughs with friends. Overall, past the first week of release, the game was not very popular, especially the Hamachi time, which while I'd certainly say this method was better than Blitzonic Advance, the process of getting everything together was still noticeably complicated and very much tedious. In the end, Blitzonic Online was a fun little experiment released to the community as a thank you for their support, but was nothing more. To say the road to releasing Sonic World DX was a difficult one would be severely understating it. The team in 2022 was under immense pressure to deliver, with the expectations set to not only match, but surpass the legacy game. And on top of that, intense stability issues, leading to Mark having to recode a good portion of the game from an older backport. This would, in turn, lead to a delay from late 2021 to late 2022 which would leave anticipation in a state higher than ever for the team to deliver an experience better and even more polished than anything that came before. However, finally after two years of hard work, Sonic World DX version 1.0 would release at Sage 2022 on September 2nd. The stakes were high this time, and there was a lot to gain and lose. But regardless, I think it's fair to say just about no one could predict what would happen next. This time around, the dev team would see the additions of Joda and Nemo Polymer for stage work, Rummy and Sonic Pox for character animations, Astral Silver X for objecting, and greatest of all, the return of the legendary Link Sonic 5, now mentally healthier than ever, and going by the name Marvel. As was predictable, the character roster was increased greatly from the demo, although not anywhere close to the level of the later legacy editions of World. V1 would clock in at 17 characters, all with expertly crafted animations. Added since the demo were the following. Although the stage roster was cut down by a hefty 8 stages from what was originally planned, DX V1 contained 14 total stages, with 5 unique missions for each stage. In comparison to the demo, V1 included a revamped Seaside Hill, Honeycomb Highway, Metal Harbor, Misty Gorge, Worst Cave, Crisis City, and new stage Mystic Jungle. Certainly a bit disappointing from an outsider's perspective, but when actually presented in the game, there's still an unbelievable amount of variety and content included. 1.0 also came with the inclusion of the new race missions, where players would have to do multiple laps around a track to complete a level. Easily the biggest change, however, in 1.0 was the inclusion of a whole new mode entitled The Island. The Island, formerly the Collection Room, was a large open area where the player could do a number of things. One could play an extra sixth mission of every stage, for example, by collecting cards and bringing them to one of two ATM machines. They could explore to find scrap stages, like Blossom Paradise, Rocky Mountain, 
Frost Peak, Glacial Clamber, and Legacy Stage Tokyo Street. And the player could also enter a shop where they could purchase and equip various skills and or handicaps. However, the most interesting thing about the island in 1.0 in general is how progression worked. See, in 1.0, the stage Worst Cave was actually locked at the start. In order to unlock Worst Cave, the player would first have to S-rank every stage's Encore mission. Once that's finished, as hinted at by a shrine on the island, S-ranking every mission of Worst Cave unlocks a card on the island that leads to the final boss, the legend himself, Egg Robo. Defeating Egg Robo, or rather entering the boss, would unlock Egg Robo as the final secret unlockable playable character of the game. Besides progression, the game would include new themes based on Sonic Gems Collection, Sonic Mega Collection, and the scrapped projects Sonic Earth and Sonic Omniverse. The Chow Garden would also return, but without much of note. Overall, from the outset, Sonic World DX version 1.0 seemed like it should have been an easy slam dunk. However, due to a few unfortunate number of bugs and bizarre design decisions, the game received mixed reception on launch. Most notably, there was a bug where due to the game's files being swarped, many newer security systems detected the game as a virus, which likely contributed to why it was not given much attention at that year's Sage. This time around, controller support was just as broken as it was in R9, Fortunately for the game, not everyone was affected by the controller support issues, and those on the other end had nothing but positive things to say. It used to be our competition was uh, a GBK fan game that no one could play, uh, a Unity fan game that didn't have many stages. Those were usually ended up being our competition at that time. So, there there wasn't really much of a choice back then. Sonic World was the only, only good Sonic fan game at the time, which is very much different now. I've seen a lot of great praise. I've seen a lot of people sh** on it because it's Sonic World, and it, we're always going to get that. We can make the game as quality as we can within the confines of the Blitz engine, and people are going to be like, well, it's on the Blitz, and so it's still sh**. You know what I mean? I've we, we, we've gotten some great criticism, and I think a lot of people are starting to treat Sonic World like, a, like well, Sonic World DX like a real Sonic game, you know what I mean? Because it's starting to feel more and more like a real Sonic game. I think we are just doing incredible things with Sonic World. Like, no other fan game does this, you know? No other fan game has this quantity of, uh, of cool content. And like, quality content, too. Like, how many fan games do you know with, like, the island? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not- the island isn't amazing by any chance, but it's so cool. I'm just so happy that the game got out. It was such a surreal feeling seeing our work and our result of our, our friendships and our, our bonds create this fucking awesome, like, culmination. Like, we were just a bunch of teenagers, you know? Like, we were just teenagers at the time, just throwing, like, building blocks together and we made something sick. I think the reception um, has been great, but ultimately, if it was bad, I wouldn't care. I'm proud of what we've created. So, while 1.0 was a definite success as far as content went, it was clear that the game simply got tripped up by annoying glitches and the super high expectations of players. In the end, DX 1.0 would ironically go on to receive less attention than its demo, and begin a kind of modding lull in the community, with many users simply deciding to wait for a big patch before returning to the game. Fortunately for them, however, it would not be too long before this would occur. Although as mentioned before, V1 did have minor patches, fixing things such as re-recommending keyboard controls and many smaller bug fixes. The real changes came in the form of Sonic World DX 1.1. Released on March 31st, 2023, 1.1 was the culmination of the dev team taking every bit of criticism and acting on it. Almost every single bug and or unpopular decision was fixed in this version. Namely, 1.1 fixed the bug that caused computers to detect the game as a virus. However, as a result, the game's files would no longer be swapped, a first for DX, and the first time since R5 for Sonic World as a whole. Besides this, the game had noticeably better performance this time around, due to the game including something referred to as the 4GB patch, a third-party software which assists games in using more of a computer's specs without having to worry about engine limitations. 
Going into the game's release, the team was joined by new character animator and former modder, Dylovsky the Fox. Dylovsky's contribution to the game was immediately seen with the addition of the new character Jet the Hawk to 1.1. A classic Sonic mod created by developer D4 was also included in the game as a bonus to show how mods worked. Although there would be no new stages, Crisis City would receive a new mission with its own unique mesh and objects, acting as a kind of new stage in a way. It would have been if this was Legacy World at least. Marathon Mode also saw a massive overhaul, with new additions like save slots and different marathon types, including Main Axe, Alternate Axe, and Endless Mode. New equips were additionally added to spice up the shop, with one even allowing for moddable music. A theme based around Sonic Frontiers was also added. And although there weren't any super major changes beyond these minor quality of life ones, every small detail would be documented and explained in depth by a video released on the official Sonic World DX YouTube channel. Unfortunately, the launch of this version would be very noticeably messy, with a lot of rampant new bugs that had to be patched days later. Additionally, this version came with the caveat of new code updates that made old save data mostly incompatible, which meant many of the players of V1 would have to start from scratch or lose a good chunk of progress. Add on top of this, ranks which were adjusted to be considerably harder, and equips which would be made increasingly more expensive, and it became clear why many longtime fans were frustrated by this release. Despite this, version 1.1 would go on to receive mixed to positive reception, with players nonetheless appreciating the bug fixes and new content. Due to not premiering at any sort of event, 1.1 went largely unnoticed, though it was popular with those already in the community regularly. The next minor update would come in the form of the bizarrely named Sonic World DX version 1.1.2, released on June 3rd, 2023. This release would bring a number of fun new minor additions, and once again include an important number of bug fixes. Much of the new content included the following, shop rebalancing, costumes, legacy mod compatibility, and a new NPC system. A video on the Sonic World DX YouTube channel goes in depth about the game's changes from 1.1. A new theme based on the game Murder of Sonic the Hedgehog was also implemented. Going into its release, the team was joined by its newest member, yours truly, your trusty narrator himself, Drox342, as an associate level designer. Although I didn't do much upon my introduction to the team, I was responsible for a number of small bug fixes in this build. The version was once again released hastily, and many members of the dev team were getting increasingly frustrated with the random releases by the project managers. Despite the issues, after a few weeks, the game received about as solid of a reception as 1.1. While many users appreciated the fixes and the new minor additions, bugs and the still unfair difficulty were heavily criticized and held the game back from fulfilling its true potential. Sonic World version 1.1.3 was released on June 30th, 2023. Although once again, rather minor, 1.3 came with an interesting number of developments. Behind the scenes, the team would be greeted with a new member, the Duck Dealer. Stage designer Jota would also be promoted to project manager, sharing the head of stage responsibility with Gerbil. As a project manager, one of the first concepts Jota put into practice was the concept of holiday-themed content, based around the time of year, similar to Sonic mobile games like Sonic Forces Speed Battle. Being that it was June at the time, the aim of 1.3 was to release a number of costumes based around LGBTQ Pride Month. Chow with colors based on the Pride flags were also included in the game, all as optional unlockables. Beyond this, a lot of polarizing difficulty changes from 1.1 and 1.2 were nerfed and a new theme was created based around Sega Superstars Tennis. Unlike the previous three releases, 1.3 would finally be the first full release of Sonic World DX to be an unproblematic and stable release. 
with its only more minor issues being fixed with a simple hot patch available on the game's Discord for download at any time. This time, the game would go on to receive an overwhelmingly positive reception across the board, with not only the devs but the players happy with the game's quality this time. Besides some minor issues, the only serious complaints came from an unusual subset of homophobic fans. These fans seemed to be upset that the game was celebrating a holiday that they themselves did not. As one would expect, the team stood firm in its support for the LGBTQ community and spoke out against the homophobic rhetoric thrown at the release. Ultimately, 1.3 laid the groundwork for what the devs could do in the future and paved the way for the loads of new content that was subsequently planned for the next version, dubbed Sonic World DX version 2.0. Although it was originally planned to make an appearance at Sage 2023, the release ended up being delayed to a further time, to produce even more content than before, and have the biggest new additions in Polish since version 1.0. However, to hold fans over, Mark would go on to release Sonic World version 1.2, which while not being covered for the sake of brevity, is the most recent and polished version of the game. So. While the fan base may not be as large as it once was, they find themselves in great hands with the DX dev team. The active developers have been consistently working on Sonic World DX out of pure passion and care for the fans it's acquired to this point. So, in spite of the odds, after 15 years and a revolving door of active devs, since its inception, Blitz Sonic still remains going as a framework for Sonic fan projects. And while its laundry list of issues may make it seem unappealing to some, it doesn't stop everyone from enjoying the sheer creativity of those who use it. So I look forward to staying tuned to Sonic World DX and standing with the team as the game strives toward its goal of standing out and above its contemporaries. This has been Drox342 with the history of Sonic World, and I wish you all a nice day.